Acts chapter 1, we'll be reading verse 8, and it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. He says again, but you will receive power. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I want to invite your attention to a simple conversation that we want to title, Help Yourself. Look at three people around you and tell them to help yourself. Help yourself. Sit down. Sit. Sit. Father, we bless you, Lord. If I had to, if I had to coin a personal testimony for my life, I would use these four simple sentences or phrases if it had not been for the Lord on my side tell me where would I be where would I be that's the epic translation to all my experienced persons in Christ if it's alright with you I want to give you the NIV translation it comes from Psalm 124 if the Lord hadn't been on our side let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side, when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive. When their anger flared against us, the flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept us away. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be the Lord who has not allowed us to be torn by their teeth. For we have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. Here we go. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I want to say it one more time. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I'm only talking to three people who've been through four storms and two tough years. Our help is only in the name of the Lord. He who makes heaven and or earth. For somebody who haven't gotten it yet, the only reason you've been able to make it through storms you couldn't even identify is because your help was in the name of the Lord who created all heaven and earth. And if I got anybody who knows that if it hadn't been for the Lord on your side, I dare you to stand up, sit back down and say, I know that's right. He did it once again. He broke me another year. He broke me another season. He kept me in another storm. I'm still here. And it's by the grace. It's by the grace. It's by the grace. Tell somebody it's by the grace. I didn't earn it. There's nothing I could have done to merit it. But it's only by the grace. It's by the grace. By the grace of God, have a seat, have a seat, I'm still here, 
I want to talk today, ladies and gentlemen. I want to turn your attention for a couple quick passages, and then we'll bring this thing to a final conclusion, and then we can have Pentecost fun, <laughs> all right? Here we go. I want you to turn with me for a moment in Luke chapter 5. This is going to seem so wayward, so gone left. Pastor T, what are you doing? I'm doing what I always do. It's called organized chaos. You, you, you know you don't catch up to me till it's too late. You won't see it coming. The Bible says in Luke chapter 5, verse 17, one day Jesus was teaching. and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. Here we go. And the power of the Lord. Happy Pentecost to you. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. You do know the same power that was with him is the same power that's now on you and I. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Some men came carrying a man. Some men came carrying a man. Some dudes who we don't get their name come carrying a dude that we don't have his name. Some men came carrying a man. Here are a couple questions I would love to ask. Who are these men? Were they on first touch? Were they on grounds? Were they even a part of a church? Who are these men? Here's another question I love to know. Who is the paralyzed man? Who is he? Not only who is he because the Bible doesn't necessarily give us these nuances, these particular uh, components or revelations will forever be trapped in historical antiquity. They will always be in biblical historicity. They will forever be in ongoing anonymity. We don't get to know their names. But more importantly than knowing their names, I'm curious with the paralyzed man, was he born this way or did life find him? Was he born this way or did life? Because there is a difference. Because some people, when we see them stuck, we assume this is all they know. But just because they're stuck doesn't mean you know where they stopped. Some people are stuck because their father abandoned them. Some people are stuck because their mother turned her back on them. Some people are stuck because of people who took advantage of them. And before you look at somebody making an assumption, your first question needs to be asked, what happened? Where did you stop? Where did you lose all feeling? Where did you lose all emotion? We have the man's geography. We have the man's pathology, but we do not have his biography. We cannot come to a clear comprehension of how he got here. What does this mean? It means that there needs to be a fair analysis of everyone's paralysis. Before you judge someone, you have to have a fair analysis of everyone's paralysis. And here's the reality. There is a reason on every row for somebody to be stuck. There is a reason on every row for somebody to be stuck. For some people, you are paralyzed relationally. Because of your hurt, you've made a decision. I'm never going to trust again. I'm never going down that road again. For some people, you are paralyzed emotionally. Because of that last pain you felt, you have allowed your heart to be seared that you don't feel anything again. And in many cases, because of the route that you have chosen to take, you have now become what once you regretted. Because you have lost emotions, you have now become the dog that hurt you. You don't feel no more. So you do whatever you want to people. Treat people however you want and expect for them to take it simply because you haven't dealt with your pain. Some people are paralyzed relationally. Some people are paralyzed emotionally. Some people are paralyzed financially. You make too much money to be this broke. 
So is it possible the only reason you grind so hard is because you're scared? This is the beauty of the Sabbath. Because when you start grinding too much and you grind out of control, you will begin to spend more than you make. And what good is that? You have lost your time. You've lost energy. You have lost relationship and you have nothing to show for it. Some, you are paralyzed relationally. Some are paralyzed emotionally. Some are paralyzed financially. Some are paralyzed spiritually. You're holding your present church hostage because of the pain of your last. You're assuming that every pastor is going to be like the one pastor that did you wrong. You're paralyzed from a spiritual standpoint, ladies and gentlemen, but here's the reality. Even in your seasons of being paralyzed, you got to have the right people around you. Because when this man was stuck, couldn't move, and couldn't do for himself, he at least had four horsemen who told him, you've been stuck here for too long. This is time for you to get yourself together. I've taken you to the club. I've taken you to Miami. I've taken you to your ex, and none of them could fix it. And this season, now I'm taking you to Jesus. You got to have a couple people on your squad who know how to say enough is enough. It's time to get you to the Savior. He was blessed to have four men who saw him at his worst and brought him to the Savior. This communicates that in some seasons, relationships doesn't beg for you to build a closeness with Jesus. They instigate it. The four men didn't ask his permission. They instigated his debt with Jesus. The Bible says in verse 18, some men, some men car- came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, tried to take him to Jesus, to the house, to lay him for Jesus when they could not find a way to do this because of the crop. They couldn't find a way to do it because of the crop. The men instigated his closeness with God. Through this instigation, they ran into an infatuation. They ran into the presence of Jesus and couldn't get close because everyone else was there. Now, here's the problem. Let's look at this conversely. We have to be careful in this generation that we don't become the crowd who gets in the way of people getting close to Christ. Some of our churches have too many rules for people to come to Jesus. We got, we got too many different levels that you got to go. I need help, and I need it now. We talk about everything else later. So the Bible says that the men instigated a relationship with Jesus, and upon, amongst taking him uh, to Jesus, they found the crowd, which communicates an infatuation that everyone was in love with him because of this crowd. They couldn't get him directly to Jesus, so they had to find a different way. So not only was there an instigation, not only was there an infatuation, but from there, there had to be innovation and elevation. Stick with me here. The Bible says some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him to the house to lay before Jesus. When they could find no way, just because you don't have a way doesn't mean there isn't a way. Sometimes when you don't have a way, God is downloading creativity for you to make a way. Do I got anybody who knows what it's like to be backed up against the wall and it seems like nothing's going to work and God begins to unload creativity in you to unload a lane that you never saw before? Sometimes your trouble is to birth a creativity of innovation. But not only did they need to have innovation, we can't get them to Jesus. You got to find a way. Not only did they need innovation, there had to be elevation. Innovation because we can't get you to the door. But we'll take you through the roof. Do you know about 20 years ago, it was March 2022, I believe, I preached my first sermon. Uh, We would call it an initial sermon. I preached my first sermon from this text 20 years ago. I, I, I titled it, Tear the Roof Off. I wasn't fully saved, but they still let me preach. He was still, he was still working on me. I, I titled it, Tear the Roof Off. The Bible says they went up. Oh, okay. They're trying to get this man to Jesus, but there was no way, so they had to find a way. There had to be innovation, and this innovation required elevation. So in order to get this man to Jesus, they had to go up. 
All right, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The man need help, but there was no way. They had to create a way through innovation. Through their innovation, they had to have elevation. So in order to get him there, the men had to go up. In order for somebody to find Jesus, there's somebody on your road that's got to go up. One of the reasons they're still so low is because they're following your path. But in order for somebody to go up, let's start with you. Tell somebody it's time to go up. We can't keep talking the same childish stuff in this same season. Somebody's got to go up. We can't keep murmuring and backbiting and gossiping about the same little stuff. Somebody's not only got to go up, somebody's got to grow up. Watch this. There was an innovation which sparked an elevation, the Bible says. They went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd. Right in front of, okay, they went up on the roof. Okay, these four men took this paralyzed man to a stranger's house. These four men took a paralyzed man. These five men are going to a stranger's house. This party was so lit, they couldn't even get in. So what they decided to do? They said, we're going to take bruh bruh on the roof. We're going to put a hole in the roof and lower him down. I mean, just, just pause for a moment. See yourself at home watching the Celtics and the Warriors tonight. And all of a sudden, yeah, we don't mean no harm. We just heard Jesus was in here. And we, Doc, I don't care if Jesus is in here. I just need to know who going who gonna to fix this hole in my roof. I, I, don't, I don't care what your excuse. I need, so in order for this to happen, not only must there be innovation, not only must there be elevation, but there must be evaluation and administration. Because before you started tearing this hole, we needed to make sure that we had a licensed contractor on our squad who can tear it right and fix it. Not only before we tear this hole in this roof, do we need a, li a licensed contractor who can tear the hole and fix it, but we need to have somebody who, who, who believes enough in generosity that when the bill comes, they can tackle it. So there needed to be an all-out plan, ladies and gentlemen. Why is this important? Because before we go into our next notice, God is calling us to evaluation, innovation, elevation, and administration. There's got to be a plan. That's why we keep talking to you about these cards. There's got to be a plan. That's why we keep coming giving you feedback because there has to be. Now, here's the problem. You need to be careful how you judge people based off of their praise. They don't feel nothing. They don't move like I move. No, 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 no. Because some people come to church to feel it. Other people come to finance it. Both gifts are necessary because without their finance, you won't be able to feel it. Not in here. So be careful how you judge people. Be careful how you look at people because they don't respond the way that you respond. We're almost there. Are you guys okay? I'm going to give you this, then I'm going to leave you alone. The Bible says in Luke chapter 5, verse 18, message translation, some men, oh, I love Eugene Peterson's translation, some men arrived carrying, not a paralyzed man. Eugene Peterson says a paraplegic on a stretcher. Eugene Peterson says some men arrived carrying a paraplegic on a stretcher. This is important because there is a thing called a paraplegic. Then there's a quadriplegic. Paraplegic means you have this function in two limbs. Quadriplegic means you have this function in four. Eugene Peterson says he was a paraplegic, meaning he had dysfunction in two limbs. Ideally, he couldn't use his legs. But just because one thing doesn't work doesn't mean you can't work something else. There has to be a season when you don't cry over what you have. You got to give thanks over what you have left because you could have took it all, but you at least left me with this. And I might not be able to use my legs, but I can use my hands and I'll wave them because he's been better than good. Watch this. The Bible says, Eugene Peterson says he is a paraplegic, not a quadriplegic. He's a paraplegic, meaning he has function in two limbs. Ideally, his upper body still works. Why is that important? Because if we have to carry you, you can at least work with us. 
Now, I know you can't use your legs, but can you at least use your arms to stabilize yourself? We trying to carry you without dropping you, but every time we turn around, you just moving, being a busybody, everything shaking. And if you fall, you're going to blame it on us. But if we're going to carry you, can you at least work with us? All right. That's the King James Version. Here's the PTV translation. I remember one time when I was younger, my wife and I were almost 19 years of marriage. 19 years of marriage in just a couple weeks. I remember when I was younger, I was fresh. We were married, but I'm still trying to prove myself. I remember we went out. We went canoeing. We went, you can tell I'm such an amateur. We went canoeing in the middle of the summer. So you know there ain't just no, there ain't no shade out in the middle of the water. It was hot out there, right? And I'm stunting. I'm rowing. I'm rowing. And she's rowing. And we end up in the middle of the water. What I didn't estimate was the strength that would be required to get us back to where we came from. So we get out there in the middle, and, and my wife, she's a little tired. And, 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 and we rowing, but we, we, we started losing rhythm. And now I'm starting to get upset because I'm hot. I just, I just explained somebody on the road behind you. I'm, I'm hot, I'm frustrated, and I'm hungry. So how about this then? So that we don't work against one another, you just stop. And I'll do my best to get us back where we came from, all right? So I'm rowing, I'm rowing, and she looking and just, and just moving. Now I'm rowing. Um, and she looking and just moved. The boat about to tip over. And, and finally, I had to say, hey, hey, hey. If you're not going to row, at least don't shake the boat. I ain't even talking to you. I'm talking to the person in the row behind you. Because in this season of ministry, with all God has placed upon our hands, if you're not going to help us row, at least don't rock the boat. If you're not going to help us in ministry, at least don't rock the boat. If you're not going to make a commitment to support, at least don't rock the boat. We've been working hard to build momentum and we don't need you stopping us. You don't have to row, but you can't rock. You can't sit and rock. You can't not row and rock. You can't not give and complain. Not in this season. I'm too old for this. You go back to bedroom Baptist for all I care. We ain't got time for none of this. We have no room for wasted energy. If you're not going to row, at least don't rock the boat. This is what the Bible says. He says in, in Luke chapter 5 verse 20, but when Jesus saw their faith. All right. I told you there was four men carrying one man. There was four men carrying one man. The one man needed the miracle. But the Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, the four men's faith. All right, here we go. So one man got a miracle because of the way four men moved. That's why you got to be careful who you let sit around you when you come to church sometimes. You got to know what's around you because there's some days I really don't have a lot of energy to move, but at least I got somebody on my row who can carry me for this week. I've been carrying this row. If I might be honest, I've been carrying this section for about the last six months. Somebody can cover me for one weekend. The Bible says one man found a miracle because of the way four men moved. The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, don't tell me you believe by faith if your faith can't be found in your feet. Faith makes you move. When you believe a job out there is yours, faith says I'm going to fill out some applications. When you believe the job is yours, you get up in the morning and put on a suit just in case the phone ring today. If you believe your man is out there somewhere, faith says take the rollers out your head, get their hair wrap off your head. I don't care if you're just in Walmart, that men's even in Walmart. If you believe it by faith, faith gets in your feet and your feet start to move. Watch this. The Bible says in a message translation, impressed 
by their bold faith, Jesus says. And impressed by their bold faith, Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven. I, I, I'm not going to touch that because that's not my focus for today. The Bible says, impressed by their bold faith. The, the bold faith of the four men, their belief that put faith in their feet to take one man to Jesus. And because of how Jesus saw four men moving, he looked at the one and said, you get up. The same motion in them is the same motion I put in you. All right, here we go. All right. That's just, sun, that's just Sunday School 101. Happy Pentecost to you, by the way. Here's a problem that I have with this passage. I've never mentioned this a day in my life. Here's a problem I have with this passage. This passage communicates a dependency on people. And I don't know, honestly, how I like that. Now, some of y'all's like, oh, it's taking a turn, and I think I love it because I'm tired of these ninjas too. No, you need grief recovery. You need help. All right? That's not what I'm talking about. But even when you have done your best to live right, there are going to be seasons when you needed people and nobody was there for you. So when I look at this passage, it is almost like I'm a bit troubled because it is communicating a dependency on people and others. But we always know even when they don't do it on purpose, there are going to be seasons where good people are going to let you down. Lord, I don't know if I want to hinge the entirety of my faith on people coming to find me and to help me move. This, this is beautiful because when I posed that question to, to, to the Lord, he, he said to me that there are times when you're stuck and can't seem to move and you can't find help anywhere. So in that season, when I'm stuck, I can't seem to move and I can't seem to find help anywhere. How do I respond? And this is what he told me. He says, uh, the miracle that you just unpacked was pre-Pentecost. <laughs> he says, now you're living in a post-Pentecost era and or generation. Help that make sense, PT. It's right there in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power. <laughs> right. I don't, know, I don't know if that's too King James for you. You will be equipped to do some things that you used to couldn't do on your own. So there might have been a season where there had to be a greater dependency on others. But with the infilling and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you have now been equipped to do some things on your own. All right, let me pause parenthetically and insert. The beauty of the coming of the Holy Spirit is not only is he a helper, not only is he a comforter, but he has this, this, this wooing ability. Somebody say woo. He had this wooing ability. How many Ric Flair fans I got in the house? Then say woo like you mean it. Woo! Woo! That ain't, all right. Thank, thank you to all, to all my uh, NWA, WCW. Yeah, we ain't talk. we're not doing the Ric Flair. Woo! Not, not this weekend. We doing the Luther. Woo, 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 woo. We're doing that Teddy Riley, that, 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 that I'll be sure, that, that woo that gets you down there in, the, in, the, in, in your loins. I'm talking that, that woo. That, that woo that had mother in the back throwing her panties on the stage in the 80s. I'm, I'm talking about, yeah, yeah, thank you for your honesty, mother. You've been delivered, but you ain't forgot. I'm, I'm, ta I'm, talking, about, I'm talking about that woo. I know you say sanctified and delivered, but I seen your yearbook, sis. <laughs> I, I, the, the, the way sometimes this older generation gets on this younger generation like you weren't there a few months ago. I seen some of my mama old pictures and I'm like, no more. I can't take it. I just can't take it. I don't want to know you that way. I just don't want to know. I, I need to believe that you've known Jesus all your life, mom. Don't do that. Why was your skirt so short, mom? Huh? When did you get to know him? Yeah, it is this, it is this wooing. It is, it is this drawing of the Holy Spirit that sometimes even when you feel like you can't go any further, the Holy Spirit begins to tap on something on the inside of you and says, come here just a little bit further. 
you can give a little bit more. You can go just a little. This Holy Spirit who doesn't give up on us, but from the inside, he begins to pull us and pull us and nudge us to the point that we begin to accomplish feats we didn't know that we could accomplish. He says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit had come upon you. Pastor T, that particular text is pre-Pentecost, well, with you and your smart self. Since you, since you want to be uh, 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 so focused on the text to that degree, here we go. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, now I really don't have to read this, but maybe we don't read this enough, so you're going to get it today. And suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Watch this. The Bible says all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit or they were filled with this power, this ability to do. This unction to function, it means that sometimes when you can't depend on the four, you can still depend on the one. That was good. That I no longer have to wait on the four. I can believe for the four, but I don't have to wait on the four because now I have one who lives on the inside of me who's stronger than the four have ever been. Pastor T, I I, I need this to make sense. This is important. Because there needs to be a fair analysis of your paralysis. For many of us, you're not paralyzed in your legs. You're paralyzed in your head. You can't think clearly anymore. Somebody hit you in that one moment in your life. They drop you in that one moment in your life and you stop believing. Somebody's, you're paralyzed emotionally. I don't want to love again. I'm never going to be that vulnerable again. You're paralyzed in your finances. You're paralyzed in your spirit man. You're you're paralyzed in your faith. So when I'm paralyzed and I can't seem to move, but I can't seem to find my four, do you mean to tell me I'm just going to be stuck here waiting on other people? No, 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 no. All right. Because the older generation taught us how to tarry. Now watch this, because in all honesty, the disciples had to tarry for the Holy Spirit because it had never come. So technically, biblically, as a a post-Pentecost church, we don't have to tarry for the Holy Spirit anymore because he is here. But sometimes you do need to tarry for the manifestation. It's one thing for him to be present. It's another thing for him to manifest himself. To reveal himself by way of the display of power. So I was thinking how uh, when I was younger, uh, y'all don't know nothing about this. We used to have church. We had church on Friday night. I was telling my wife this other day. This is a testimony that's worth sharing for the rest of my life. We had church on Friday night at 7. We had prayer from 7 to 8. We had had church from 8 to about 10, 30, 10, 45, 11 o'clock. 11.30 11.30 sometime. This is on Friday night. S- Sunday morning, we, we had uh, Sunday school started at 9 o'clock, I believe. We had to go at 10 o'clock into the sanctuary. We had to give our report. They had to make sure you were listening. So everybody goes into the sanctuary after Sunday school. Everybody gives a report for what you learn. After that, you had about 15 minutes. We go run to Bob's, get some nachos, some Fritos, some jungle juice, because we're going to be here for a while. You then go into the sanctuary. Sanctuary, you got devotion. Devotion means that, oh, I don't say this disrespectfully. This is reality. Devotion basically meant we ain't rehearsed. <laughs> so I was in the shower, and the Lord put this song on my heart. Musicians, just catch me. Just catch <laughs> Now, that wasn't even fair. I think about y'all all the time. That wasn't even fair. You, you, you want us to catch a song that came to you in your shower <laughs> in front of all these people. And then when it don't come together, you're going to blame it on the devil. It was you. You could have voice recorded that and sent it. 
So we got 30, 45 minutes, depending on the pastor ready or not, because he still might be working on that last piece of sermon. Comes out, then the, then the junior pastor goes up. He's got about 30 minutes of exhortation. Only supposed to be 10 minutes, but he's got 30 minutes of exhortation. This is the pre-sermon. This is a sermon before the sermon. The choir could, no, I forgot. We don't even have a choir yet because you got the announcements. We ain't doing nothing, but we got 15 minutes of telling you about what we want to do, but we ain't doing nothing yet. After that, the choir comes up. They're going to do two songs. The first one, ah, I probably should have rehearsed that a little bit longer. Then the second one, they kind of survive. All right. Pastor comes up. He prepares us for, 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 for the offering. All right. He goes in a good 10, 15 minutes. We're going to get a good offering. Then we got to get a second offering because the first offering only rate $112.33. All right. We need 97 more cents. Anybody get, help us with 97 more cents? All right, I'm being facetious, but work with me here. Then we got to go to that third song. That third song, the power better fall. Because if the power don't fall, pastor's going to be preaching on somebody. So if the power don't fall, you got to go and grab it and throw it. Because somebody's got to get power today. That might take 20 minutes, type might take 30 minutes. Pastor gets up, preaches for an hour, preaches for 90 minutes. Sometimes if it's really feeling good to him, not really feeling good to us, but it's feeling good to him, he goes in for two hours. Now, it's... Did I tell you we started at nine? By now it's three o'clock. We clearly done missed the first round of NFL games. Here's the problem. Now you got to go home, get your Cornish hen out of the oven because we got to do it again at seven. I tell you, we had Sunday night church too. But here's, here's, here's one thing that, that old school church taught me. They taught me how to shift the room. Because there's sometimes, in all honesty, where you have been paralyzed and I can't wait on my four. So I got to learn how to shift an atmosphere all by myself. That when I can't depend on other people to help me, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I got to learn how to help myself. So you, 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 you sit up on a chair and, 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 and y'all don't even know songs like this. Sweep over my soul. Sweep over my soul. Holy Spirit, sweep over my soul. Anybody remember that song? Sweep over my soul. Sweep over my soul. Holy Spirit, sweep over my soul. Now, I know you might not be feeling nothing, but if you got anything in you, you can feel something turning. And that's what this song was for. It was kind of get the atmosphere situated. So, so and they sing it again. Sweep over my, I supposed to be paralyzed. Soul, sweep over my soul. Holy Spirit, sweep over my soul. Sweep over my soul. Sweep over my soul. Holy Spirit, sweep over my soul. They say, I need the old. I need thee every hour. I need thee, oh, bless me now. It didn't take a lot of effort, just a pure heart. My Savior, I, I come. To, to thee, I need thee, oh, I, I need thee, every hour, I need thee, I'm good, hopeless, oh, we're done now. Me now, my Savior, I come. How many of you feel the shift in the room? I come. You done forgot about the people who left you. For I, I 
come to to the here we go lift your voice and say yes there it goes yes God, we bless yes yes Lord yes Lord yes Lord yes 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 Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallow be. Hallow be. Hallow be. Hallow be. One more time. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So here's today's sermon in a nutshell. The power of Pentecost is that while help from others is a bonus, but I have given you the power to help yourself. That when depression sits on you, you got to learn to fight it and help yourself. When your emotions become taxed, you got to come back spiritually and help yourself. When your children are acting up at home, help yourself. Turn off every video game. Turn off every electronic device. Everybody get in this room. Get in the room. Get on your knees. Go to sleep if you want to. But we're going to saturate this atmosphere and believe God to change something. The post-Pentecost church does not have to rely exclusively from the help on another hand. The coming of the Holy Spirit was to empower you to help yourself. You watch too much Netflix to be this despondent. Help yourself. Your marriage is in too much trouble to be acting like every day is vacation. Help yourself. You don't have to be in the church. You can be in your car. You can be in your cubicle. You can be in a bathroom. You can be on a lawnmower. Some of my best messages came on a lawnmower. Because of the busyness of ministry, I hired somebody to cut my grass. When COVID came, I fired him and bought my own lawnmower again. And it was the best investment of my life. Because when I get on my lawnmower, I don't have everything coming in and out. It's just an opportunity for me to commune with him. And he speaks and I write. And he speaks and I voice record. And he speaks and I text our leadership team. He said it, it's about to go down. And it came, not in church, 
it came in a place where I made a decision to help myself. You're not as broke as you think you are. You're not as broken as you think you are. You're not as damaged as you think you are. You've just gone too long without helping yourself. That right there was not what I learned in church. That was what I learned in my house. On one, one week night, of my, my father would call everybody in, say, get on your knees. Man, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of this. It don't make sense. And he starts singing, and him and my mom start praying, and all of us are asleep. But till this day, church didn't teach me how to shift a room like that. That came from experience. Sometimes you're going to need that when the enemy comes at you like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard. What is your standard? Sometimes it's just calling on his name. Jesus, 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 there is something know where that came from about that name master savior Jesus like a fragrance after the rain Jesus Jesus, Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim for kings and kingdoms shall all pass away. But there's something about. Listen, watch this. I mean this with every fiber in me. This is a conversation my pastor had with me. I shared it with our worship team. It's changed things for us. I want to share it with you. You need to know this. My pastor said to me one day, he said, Terry, you know the hymns? I said, I said yes, sir. I was born and raised on the hymns. He said, do y'all sing them regularly? I said, no, sir, we don't sing the hymns regularly. He said, Terry, I need you to go home and you need to ensure that if nothing else, one Sunday minimally, at least, your church needs to be singing the hymns. I said, yes, sir, I'm listening. He says, your generation was the last generation that was brought up on the hymns. And what's happening is this next generation has been separated from the hymns. And because we don't sing them regularly, our children are not hearing them regularly, and we're raising a generation of children who won't know them. And they won't know them because we didn't sing them. I know them today because my elders sang them. And we're raising a generation of children who won't know them because we don't think they're important. Since hymns are almost the most equivalent of scripture. They are sacred. They have gone over an extended period of time. Now, I'll be honest. I, I might need a hymn with some stank on it. I need some bass, put some lead on it. Give me some rhythm. I'm not falling asleep. It ain't funeral time in here. I need to lean with it, rock with it. But when I find it and it finds me, it'll put you on the floor. Lift your hands all across the room. Father, your word says, and we shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has, become, has come upon us. And with that power, we shall become witnesses. Witnesses. Here's the beauty of a witness. Something's going on legally. 
and you were present, meaning you saw it. It means that you were a witness. And if you were a witness, you may receive invitation to come to court and testify. It doesn't mean you have to prove anything. Just tell what you saw. You were a witness. Testify. And the Bible says you shall receive power. And with that power, you shall be witnesses. I don't want to testify of something that I've lost from. Don't call me to be a witness for something that's going to degrade me, undermine me, or get me in trouble. If the Holy Spirit says you're going to be a witness, it also communicates that you're going to be a winner. By the power I placed in you, you are going to testify of what I've done in your life. You are going to be a witness. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. If you'll consider those in context, Jesus is really sending these disciples back to places they didn't want to go. He says, I need you to take my message back to where they crucified me. I need you to take my message back to my home because a, perfect, a prophet is not uh, worthy or he's not worthy of honor in his own town. I need you to take it back where they wouldn't receive me in flesh. Now they can receive it by way of the Holy Spirit. Watch this. And then the, gent the uttermost parts were the place of Gentiles. Why is this important? Because Gentiles to Jews were considered nothing more than fuel for fire. In essence, you are coal in hell. You just keep the fire burning. As Gentiles, that's all you're good for. Jesus says, I need you to take this same gospel back to those who are cast down, downtrodden, and looked over. And you shall be a witness to all of these. Lift your hands again. Father, your word says, and we shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon us, and we shall be your witnesses. I pray, Lord, that through the power of the Holy Ghost, that we develop an unction to function even the more, to be of witness everywhere that we go on our jobs, in our community, in our relationships, the ones that make it and the ones that don't. Use me to testify of your goodness, of your grace, and your mercy, most importantly, of your salvation. However you see fit, use me, Lord. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. It's in Jesus' name. You're here today. You don't know Jesus, but you want to know. Boy, you better cut that out. Oh, shucks. It's Pentecost Sunday. Let's just do it one time. Lift your voice and sing. Hand it flows. It flows.